Hello, I'm Kelly Eversole, the Executive Director of the International Wheat Genome Sequencing Consortium. And I am joined today by Eugene Zhao from yeah. Pudong University. And before we get into that presentation, I'd like to give you a little overview of the IWGSC. So the International Wheat Genome Sequencing Consortium is a, sorry, um, an international consortium that consists of over 3,300 members in 900, more than 900 institutes and companies in 71 countries. We also have nine sponsors uh, and sponsors because they make it possible for us to have this uh, webinar series as well as to do any of the other activities that we have ongoing. So we've most recently been we uh, announced a, a new sponsor, which is CIMIT, and we're really great. We're really greatly pleased to have them back in our as a sponsor and back engaged with the IWGSC directly. So our vision after the, what we call IWGSC 2.0, after we publish the reference sequence, is to continue to work on enhancing breeding through an increased understanding of the molecular basis of traits and their allelic diversity. Our activities this year have been to uh, try to uh, continue our Arbor Biosciences collaboration, and we're also in the process of some developing some other interesting collaborations that we hope you'll be hearing about soon. We also published uh, earlier this year the reference sequence version 2.1, as well as a new annotation version 2.1. And we're in the process of trying to publish a very clear process for contributing how you as individuals can contribute to manual and functional annotation. We're also starting our IWGSC Wheat Diversity Project and with the goal of, of doing reference sequences for at least eight land races that represent the breadth of wheat diversity. And we pushed for pre-publication releases of genome sequences for elite varieties and other genomic resources. And obviously we have the webinar series. Our next uh, webinar will be in November with Ellie Tagan from Cornell University, who will talk to us about challenges and opportunities in positional cloning and structural, structural variation in polyploid crops. So I encourage you to register for that and to be with us for that live webinar. So just to give you, uh, remind you about how the dashboard works, uh, there will be a Q&A uh, section at the end of the presentation, and you can submit your questions in the Q&A panel. You can monitor the chat panel to see messages from, from us as organizers, and that might include other links to things that are mentioned in the presentation. You can already download handouts of our presentations from the handout panel uh, by going there. And just to remind you that this will be a, uh, this is recorded and it will be posted on the YouTube channel and you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. So without further ado, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Yi Jing Xiao and from Fudan <laughs> University who's going to talk to us about the interaction between wheat cysts and trans factors in shaping regulatory networks. And hopefully she'll forgive me for mispronunciation of the last name. So, Yi Jing. So I start to share my uh, slides. Can you see that? We see it as a, before you put it in slide mode. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Thanks, Kelly. Um, I think the pronunciation is, is okay. I'm Yi Jin Zhang from Fudan University. Um, I'm very glad to have this opportunity to introduce our recent work about the interaction between weight cysts and trans factors in shaping regulatory networks. 
uh, related to evolution and adaptation. The widely cultivated wheat is derived from two successive polyploidization events, after which the hexaploid wheat was rapidly adapted and established as important crops around the world. Compared to, compared to its progenitors, common wheat has much broader adaptability to a wide range of environmental conditions. This has been ascribed to the convergence of individual genomes adapt to different environments, as well as the fast generation of new diversity in hexaploid wheat. Recent studies have reve revealed extensive subgenome-specific gene family expansions and divergent transcription, while how the subgenome divergence is dynamically and precisely regulated is still largely unclear. Just as architecture gives the soul to the stone, regulatory divergence endowed gene networks with high plasticity. Transcriptional regulation consists of the interaction between cis and trans elements. Cis elements are generally local, D local DNA regulatory elements, typically promoters and enhancers. Trans factors are typically transcription factors, which bind to cis regulatory DNA elements and cause changes in transcription. Detection of cis and trans acting factors is the basis for elucidating regulatory network. This is a challenging task in wheat with extremely large genomes. Here are the genome window in Arabidopsis and in wheat. The Arabidopsis genes are densely distributed and the average distance between genes is about two kilobases. And it is easier to detect regulatory elements even merely based on experiments. While in wheat genome, the genes are distantly distributed. There are abundant distant, distant regulation as reviewed by our recent high c results. We applied epigenomic strategies to detect genome-wide cis elements and transfactor bindings. Today, I'm going to introduce our recent studies in these two aspects. And here are the relevant publications. First is detecting cis elements and subgenome divergent regulation. We follow the following three steps, including identifying regulatory elements from the large genome, assigning target genes to enhancers, and detecting subgenome regulatory divergence by integrating multi-omics data. To detect the regulatory DNA elements from the large intergenic regions, we employed the strategy commonly used in human study. The principle is that the interplay between cis regulatory elements and epigenetic modifications is crucial for regulating gene activity. In humans, the major regulatory elements, including promoters and enhancers, are largely predictable based on chromatin features, typically these active chromatin modifications. We, probed, we profiled chromatin uh, architecture of red wheat and seedlings, including profiling histone modifications by ChIP-seq. Uh, chromatin accessibility by DNAs1 hypersensitive site sequencing and DNA, uh, DNA methylation by bisulfate sequencing. The genomic regions marked by these modifications were divided to different chromatin states based on the combinations of marks, which were associated with a distinct enrichment of biological activities. For example, State 5, highly enriched for these active states, uh, likely represent active regulatory elements, including promoters and enhancers. We next examine the genetic 
and the epigenetic features of different chromatin states. These are the uh, chromatin states. These chromatin states were characterized by a high degree of chromatin openness, uh, low DNA methylation levels, and abundant CPG islets, all of which are typical features of active regulatory activity. In addition, conservation implies biological significance. Regions in these states are most likely functional conserve, functionally conserved given the highly conserved sequences in epigenetic activities. Next, here the targets of enhancers were assigned uh, through correlating epigenetic patterns with promoters. Uh, briefly, we first profiled the chromatin activity in a large number of tissues and in response to external various external stimuli. The densities of the active marks uh, K9, acetylation, and K4, trimethylation, were highly correlated, but they are negatively correlated with the densities of K27 trimethylation because this is a repressive mark. Since the epigenetic activity of distal regulatory elements are highly synchronized with those as the promoters of targets, we correlated the densities of these epigenetic markers in all samples between enhancers and promoters. The correlation result, we, we compared the correlation results to the uh, high C results the latter of which represent, reflect the physical interactions between enhancers and promoters. Here, these pairs with high, uh, with high, with strong physical interactions as detected by high C have highly correlated epigenetic activities. Here is an example. The enhancer region, the enhancer promoter pair, this is conserved uh, in May, between maize and wheat. Here, the maize gene is duplicated, was duplicated in wheat, but the interaction with these regulatory elements was remembered by both of these two gene copies. In this way, a total of almost uh, 90,000 genes were detected to be targeted by, uh, by about uh, 200 distal regulatory elements. Next, to detect the subgenome divergent regulation, regulatory elements were divided to different groups of based on combinatorial epigenetic patterns, namely group one regulatory elements targeted by H3K9 acetylation and K4 trimethylation. Group two, target, group two uh, regulatory elements are targeted by all three marks and group three targeted by K27 trimethylation only. Their sequences and epigenetic patterns were compared across three subgenomes. Here, the resulted in three classes. The first class include regulatory elements with, homolog with homologous sequences and belonging to the same epigenetic group across all three subgenomes. And the second class include regulatory elements with homologous sequences, but not in the same epigenetic group. And third class are those regulatory elements with no homologous sequences across three subgenomes. For each epigenomic epigenetic group defined in the defined here, the fraction of each class of regulatory elements were calculated. The most apparent pattern is that about half of group three regulatory elements have no sequence homology across subgenomes. Uh, that is between A and D, between B and D, and between A and B. So these uh, regulatory elements are preferentially marked by K27 trimethylation only. Further comparison with the tissue specific expression revealed that group three regulatory element targets have apparently higher tissue specificity. 
uh, here, the one represents these genes are mostly expressed only in one tissue. And uh, this group of genes, group three targets, are mostly expressed in spiclet. Uh, we further reveal that the spiclet specific expression of K27 trimethylation demethylase, RAF6, is closely associated with extensive reduction of spiclet K27 trimethylation. And here we propose that spiclet specificity is potentially regulated by subgenome divergent regulatory elements marked by K27 trimethylation. Uh, in terms of subgenome divergent regulation of stress responses, we examine the relationship between epigenetic changes and gene expression changes following stress in phytohormone treatments. Here, the x-axis represents all genes responsive to the treatments, ranked according to their expression level for change. The y-axis represents the corresponding epigenetic changes for each mark. The K4 and K9 acetylation changes were positively associated with gene expression changes. But the K27 trimethylation change or changes were not. Therefore, K4 trimethylation and K9 acetylation are likely involved in responses to external stimuli. Next, to determine the mechanisms underlying specific alterations of K4 trimethylation and K9 acetylation, we predicted the related transcription factors based on K4 and K9 changes. We observed that the motif, the motif enrichment analysis revealed that AP2 BRF type transcription factor binding sites are top enriched in regulatory elements with increased K4 and K9 levels triggered by these treatments. We, cl we clarified the quantitative epigenetic changes using ABA trigger changes. Among the 10 AP2 ERF type PFs induced by ABA, AP2, AP2-1 exhibited the highest upregulated expression. We successfully obtained the genome-wide binding of AP2-1 uh, AP through DAPSEQ. The binding of, of AP21 was significantly enriched in regulatory elements with apparently increased K4 trimethylation and K9 acetylation levels. These genomic tracks illustrated the binding of AP21 in densely distributed AP21 motifs in promoter of ABA highly induced PP2C. Therefore, the orchestrated epigenetic change and specific transcription factor binding ensured prediction of responsive cis and transacting factors by quantitative epigenomic approaches, uh, by quantitative epigenomic uh, alterations. A closer examination of the genomic tracks lead to the observation that in subgenome A and D, the AP21 displayed stronger binding and higher density of AP2 motifs surrounding PP2C. So we wondered whether this quantitative association of the subgenome divergence is a general feature on genome-wide level, which may reflect regulatory mechanism regarding subgenome divergence. We quantitatively compare the AP21 binding, binding regions, epigenetic modifications, as well as AP2 motif densities across three subgenomes. Each data set was divided to seven categories based on the relative density in A, B, and D subgenomes. Further enrichment analysis revealed that the subgenome biased AP21 binding was apparently correlated with the AP21 motif, AP2 motif density and also positively correlated with um, subgenome biased K9 acetylation and K4 trimethylation read densities. 
Uh, in summary, these findings reveal the subgenome divergent regulation is likely orchestrated by the interplay between genetic and epigenetic heterogeneity. In summary, the above findings revealed the coordination between uh, sequence contexts, that is the regulatory elements, epigenetic factors, and transcription factors in regulating subgenome uh, divergence related to tissue specificity and stress responses, based on which the quantitative epigenomic uh, strategies could be applied for a mechanism study uh, in the large weed genomes. The next part is about profiling of transcription factor binding. CheapSeq is an efficient method for detecting transcription factor binding sites. However, uh, cheap experiments rely on specific antibodies or genetically modified marker strings to specifically precipitate transcription factors. Therefore, they, are ha they, they have been conducted mainly in a model organisms. Uh, DAPSIC is a recently developed alternative technique for characterizing genome-wide transcription factor binding. It involves a in vitro expression of transcription factors and an incubation with DNA library to probe specific binding of transcription factors. The development of DAPSIC has enabled the high throughput profiling of transcription factor networks. To construct the transcriptional regulatory network responsive to environmental stimuli in Triticum uratu, the progenitor of the A subgenome, we profiled the genome-wide binding of a large a large number of relevant transcription factors using DAPSeq. 142 transcription factors associated with ABA and abiotic stresses were collected, and DAPSeq data was success were successfully generated for 116 transcription factors. After stringent filtering steps, we obtained 53 high-quality transcription factor binding profiles. Here are the genomic uh, profiles of the binding of these transcription factors and the epigenetic patterns uh, surrounding RD29. This is a typical marker used for monitoring stress responsive pathways. It is known that its promoter regions include ABRE and DRB, DRE motifs, and the expression is regulated by multiple stress responsive factors. To compare the in, vi the in vitro DNA binding with in vivo experiments, we, per we performed an AP2 DREB7 chip seek in protoplast. Um, we compared the sequence and epigenetic features between the common and unique peaks. The reported representative motif for AP2 DREB7 binding was enriched in both SAP unique and common peaks, but not in CHIPSIC unique peaks, suggesting the non-direct bind, suggestive, suggestive of a non-direct binding of these CHIP unique peaks. In comparison with in vivo histone marks indicated that the DAP signal, the DAP unique peaks were highly enriched in bivalent loci that these are the they are occupied by repre re repressive mark H three K twenty seven trimethylation and active mark H three K four trimethylation mark. Bivalent loci are reported to be prepared for internal and ex external alterations. Under normal conditions, they are kept in a poised state. Following stimulation. K27 trimethylation is removed, and the occupation of K4 trimethylation ensures rapid activa activation. Therefore, it is likely that the DAPSIC binding pattern represents the binding potential. 
The depth unique on site are occupied by histone marks under normal conditions, but may be activated by specific transcription factor binding in response to external stimuli. We further integrated the expression data responsive to abiotic stresses to in investigate the functional potential of these transcription factor binding, focusing on the expression changes of the proximal target genes. The target of most transcription factors were primary, primarily stress responsive. For example, the transcription factor ZFHD2 uh, its binding is significantly enriched near genes that are both up and down regulated in, uh, in these stresses, but not enriched near genes that have no significant expression change in, in these stresses. A comparison of the genome-wide transcription factor binding patterns revealed that they are largely grouped by transcription factor families. Different groups are preferentially localized to different chromosome regions. The AP2 transcription factors mostly bind the uh, distal end of the chromosomes, uh, while NAC transcription factors bind across the chromosomes. Here is the distance distribution relative to the nearest genes this, vary, this uh, varied substan substantially among transcription factors. About 80% of AP2 ERF23 uh, peaks localized within 10 KB of genes, whereas almost 90% of NAC18 peaks were distantly related to genes, reflecting the remote regulation of targets. There are rounds of TE bursts, transposable elements bursts, predate the, uh, the accompanied uh, treatised divergence, uh, leading to extremely large genomes with abundant transposable elements. Recent studies in animals and plants suggested that transposable elements have been a rich source of new TFDS that is uh, transcription factor binding sites in our study. We explored to, to what extent have TEs promoted the ongoing evolution of wheat transcriptional regulation and how these TE-derived transcription factor binding sites evolve. In our data sets, a large fraction of transcription factor binding sites were embedded in transposable elements. Transposable elements are largely repressed by DNA methylation and with low chromatin accessibility. Here, we observe that almost uh, 40,000 transcription factor binding sites uh, are imb embedded in transposable elements. Uh, they are open and strongly associated with active chromatin signatures. Uh, including reduced DNA methylation, here the blue line, reduced DNA methylation and active histone, histone marks. Uh, the signature reflected by the blue line were shared between uh, transcription factor binding sites contributed by transposable element sequences, here the blue line, and by now T by non-transposable element sequences uh, represented by the pink line, suggesting their common regulatory potential. We next wondered if any T transposable element family contributed a significant number of bindings, uh, binding sites for specific transcription factors. We examined the transcription factor binding size distribution in differentially enriched transcription uh, transposable element families. A significant proportion of the binding sites was embedded in specific repeat families. LTR Gypsy family 13 is the largest contributor, accounting for 20% of the binding sites. The most enriched transcription factor binding sites 
contributed by this T transposable element family, including members of the AP2 family. It is likely that insertion of transposable elements from these families lead to transposable and tra lead to a transcription factor binding size expansion. Therefore, we examine the emergence and expansion of these transposable elements families. No homologous transposable families were observed, be predate, uh, were, were, were detected in non treated species, indicating the majority of binding of these transposable elements were amplified in treated cell species. Um, we next wondered, we next asked whether the transposable elements in, uh, are in RLG gypsy family uh, 13 have a single origin. Uh, that is, they are preferentially originated from one branch of the phylogenetic tree. In contrast to our expectation, these transposable elements were dispersed in the uh, TE family clusters, indicating multiple transcription factor binding events occurred during the evolution of these transposable elements, transposable families. In addition, transposable elements containing TE containing PFBS overlapping with DHS. This is the DNA's hypersensitive sites reflecting the committing openness. For those TE derived, for those TE embedded TFBS overlapping with DHS, they are relatively ancient. Their age are relatively ancient suggestive of a long period of degeneration of TEs as regulatory elements. Therefore, the degeneration of TEs, the degeneration of treated cell specific uh, ALTR gypsy families is likely subjected to a relatively long-term evolutionary selection uh, to evolve to uh, TFBS. To fully evaluate the evolutionary contribution of TE embedded TFBS to non TE TFBS, particularly those with gene proximal binding, we completed a reciprocal sequence comparison between a TE embedded TFBS and non TE TFBS. We observed that 24% of non-TE TFBS showed high sequence similarity with TE embedded TFBS, which is significantly higher as compared to random pairs. These non-TE TFBS potentially derived from TE sequences and will be and are referred to as a TE derived TFBS hereafter. Uh, these, those TE-derived TFBS were mostly specific to treated, species, to treated species, with almost no homologous sequences in non-treated species, suggesting the transposition and degeneration are treated specific. Here is the multiple sequence alignment of homologous TE-embedded and TE-derived TFBS. The tree included both types of uh, TFBS mixed together, reflecting the ongoing spread of TE embedded TFBS to non TE regions. To quantitatively measure the extent of TE degeneration and TFBS regulatory activity, the TE derived TFBS were partitioned based on sequence similarity with corresponding TE embedded TFBS. Here, level one represents low divergence and level four represents high divergence with the TE embedded TFBS. In general, the TE derived TFBS were localized much closer to much more uh, proximal to genes as compared to the TE embedded TFBS and had more regulatory activities as reflected by high sequence conservation across species, lower DNA methylation levels, 
and more active epigenetic signatures, including uh, increased chromatin accessibility, uh, increased uh, K4 and K9, uh, K4 trimethylation and K9 acetylation. Therefore, the extensive degeneration, uh, that is the decreased similarity to TE sequences, was associated with increased gene proximity and regulatory activity. Uh, these results reflect the ongoing insertion and decay of transposable elements as gene proximal regulatory elements. We further integrated transcriptomic data from RICE of similar uh, abiotic stress treatments and identified genes commonly and uniquely induced in wheat. We reviewed that a group of uh, TE-derived TFDS target target genes in wheat have been added to the network regulating stress responses. Members of WRKY WRKY family contributed more to the uh, wheat-specific responsive genes than to the common responsive genes. Despite that, we do not expect that all binding events directly affect gene activity. These findings provide important evidence of the evolutionary effects of transposable element remnants on transcriptional regulation. Uh, here, I will summarize the uh, major findings in my study. Uh, for the first study, we observed the coordination between regulatory elements, epigenetic factors, and the transcription factors in regulating subgenome divergence. Uh, reflecting that, indicating that the quantitative epigenomic strategies could be applied for mechanism study in the extremely large wheat genomes. Uh, for the second study, uh, we reviewed the high plasticity of the wheat stress response regulatory elements, as well as the importance of TEs in promoting ongoing relative uh, regulatory innovation. innovation. Finally, I will introduce our uh, uh, data resources, data generated in our studies. Uh, here are the links to the epigenomic data in uh, seedlings uh, with different types of uh, epigenetic, epigenomic data, as well as in uh, different developmental stages and in response to various abiotic stresses and phytohormones. And here are the JBrowser, -browser, and the, this is the uh, links to these data. And you may uh, uh, browse, uh, zoom in, zoom out, or search any uh, gene or uh, genomic uh, locus uh, that, is, uh, that are interested. Here is a link to the second study. Uh, these are the uh, DAPSIC profiles for uh, 120, 100, uh, for more than 100 uh, transcription factors, uh, which we, pro we perform uh, DAPSEQ. And here is the uh, GBrowser to browse these tracks. For any gene or a uh, locus of interest, uh, you may directly uh, search and view. Uh, this is a visual visualization of the data, and it is interactive visualization. And here is the link to this data. Uh, finally, I would like to uh, thank all my group members and the collaboration groups uh, for their uh, insightful comments and, uh, and, and all the help. Uh, Zijun and Lu Huan in my, lab, in my lab are in charge of the experiments and other members perform the analysis. Uh, the DHS data is kindly, kindly generated by Professor Wen Li Zhao from Nanjing Agricultural University and uh, Professor Xu and Tong from uh, IGDB helped the material, helped with the materials and data generation. And I'm also grateful uh, to the insightful comments from uh, Professor uh, Ji Jinjia from Chinese Academy, Academy of Agricultural Sciences and, uh, and Professor uh, Liu Bao from North East Normal University uh, for their uh, helpful comments.
Uh, thank you all for the uh, listening, and I will take uh, questions. Great. Thank you very much, Yijing Zhao. This was uh, an excellent uh, presentation and overview of the work that you've been doing. Uh, Thank you. It's a little bit fa fast, and uh, or maybe I can, uh, uh, any for, for those who are interested, they may, they may contact me or read the, many, read the papers uh, listed, uh, listed here. Ah, yes, I forgot to let you do the papers, so, yeah. All right, um, so just to remind everyone that you can, in fact, uh, put your questions in the Q&A panel. And even if we don't have a chance to get to them today, we will uh, respond to them subsequently to the presentation. Um, so this is a, this reinforces something that, that I personally have been very interested in for a long time, that if we want to understand regulation, we can't simply look at the genes. Um, so from your work, how, what would you do in terms of the next steps for actually using the information you've done to put it into a breeding population, given the breadth of the transposable elements and the potential for extremely large impacts uh, as a result of the transposable elements. Uh, so you mean how can I make all this data um, friendly to to be used? And we currently we are construct constructing a uh, platform. Uh, uh, at present, uh, users could use the broad could, could have here I was here. at present. Uh, the users may use this uh, this uh, this browser. Uh, the, so this browser only provides the ability to browse and to search and to browse. Or a more uh, complicated usage, for example, to a more some more uh, helpful tools, including the uh, search enrichment analysis uh, to browse the networks. Uh, we are constructing this sort of uh, web-based uh, platform and we're also integrating uh, various uh, various sorts of uh, tools to make it more uh, friendly to users uh, hopefully the database uh, could be i will make it publicly available uh, within this year in about one or two months it's almost down okay so someone uh, dan smith in fact has tried to connect to the dap-cs epigenome link and it appears that it it is dead so perhaps you could double check that uh, link. You mean, uh, the second one or uh, no the uh no the first one the first one not the dap dapsic or uh, that one right there, the the uh, there yeah. is something wrong with that oh, well. ah Okay. Uh, this is a right link. Uh, I missed this hybrid with the second one. I'm sorry for that. Okay. All right. So, this is that, uh, that in. so it, in terms of, oh, you're going to, yeah, that would be great oh, if you could show us what the link actually looks like. Yeah, it works now. Uh, can you see my uh, desktop? Yes. Yeah. It could be. Uh, browse for any gene or any loci of interest. You may use this uh, JBrowse to, to have a look. Uh, it could be search here, the gene name or the region could be searched here and you may select any data you're interested in. Yeah. Okay. And just contact just contact me if there is any. Uh, problems. Uh, yeah. So you mentioned about making these resources uh, available in the public domain. Uh, is it possible to add those to some of the international uh, repositories, such as what we have at the URGI or grain genes in the US or ensemble plants? Uh, is it possible to, to do that? 
Oh, I'm glad if they uh, if they agree, I'm glad to be put to their their platform. Yeah. yeah. So once you make it public, then we could potentially bring those into some of the other platforms for user friendly to make it more user friendly to people who use different databases. Actually, these data are all publicly available now. So. But what kind of, what type of data or what type of files do you, do you need? That I don't know because I don't do that part of it. So, but yeah. we will check. Mm, we will. Okay, just kind of me. I appreciate your willingness to do that. So mm. let's get uh, to some of the other questions that have come in. Um, have you looked at translocated chromosome segments? Translocated. Translocated. I mean, yeah. I, I use the Chinese spring. Uh, what does the translocated mean? Located from where to, to where? <laughs> okay, so let me continue. Compared with cultivars without the translocation, are the epigenetic marks consistent with their original location, the new, or do they obtain new epigenetic patterns? Uh, I see. Translocated means, uh, if I understand correctly, translocation means a, a sort of a duplication or yeah, translocated by some transposable elements. Yeah, this is an interesting question, and this is also what we are interested in. Uh, we check some, actually, we also check some uh, intergress, intergressed fragments. And uh, compared to its original uh, loci, the expression, both expression and epigenetic uh, modifications were changed. For most of them, their uh, expression and epigenetic uh, environment has been changed. Yeah, this is an uh, interesting, possibly due to the um, uh, evolutionary uh, pressure, uh, and uh, they need to be. Uh, there should be some uh, new function or to be evolved and or expressed in uh, uh, different tissues, and this is common for a duplicated gene, and so this is expected. Uh, for both the uh, sequence divergence for a duplicated gene showing uh, sequence divergence and epigenetic divergence. Okay, well, he, he did go on to, to say that these are subtelomeric translocations within the wheat 10 plus genome project. So, yeah. Oh, okay, I will follow that. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so, in t what you're, you've developed some an atlas and trying to move that forward. What are your next steps in terms of your your work? <laughs> uh, actually, uh, my interest in is in the basics. That a basic uh, to answer some uh, interesting scientific questions, uh, but. Uh, due to the pressure of the funding. Uh, next, I will pay more attention to the uh, breeding related or such as the, the quality, the yield, the yield quality or something like that to develop some interesting uh, uh, tools and or some new uh, methods uh, to promoting the breeding process. Yeah, that's the next my next focus. Hmm. Okay, so in getting talking a little bit more about the transposable elements and the stress response that you were working on, is it possible that it's something? I mean, in in terms of the impact of stress, not only from from drought or water stress or whatever it might be, it may be a biotic stress, you know, uh, that could, could occur. Are there ways in which you can actually tackle that complexity in terms of identifying which, what are the transcription binding, uh, 
transcription factor binding sites that are Im impacted by these different levels of stress. Because you talk about the idea that we can use this information now for breeding. So if we think of potential with CRISPR-Cas or some of the genome editing, are there ways in which we can actually get at that? And how would we do that, given the breadth of transposable elements within wheat? Um, from these atlas of data, we can predict which transcription factors may be the master regulator of the biotic or abiotic stresses. If you have a um, time course data, and you may do the, uh, you may uh, construct the co-expression network, or just do the correlation analysis to see um, which trans the correlation factor to see the expression of the transcription factor and uh, uh, and uh, and uh, and your tar and your genes of interest. For example, the marker gene of the uh, the marker gene response to the abiotic stresses. If it is if the uh, transcription of the trans transcription factor a specific transcription factor co-expressed with the marker gene. Uh, you may collect, it, collect such sort of uh, transcription factors and perform the second analysis, that is the uh, motive and motive analysis, to see whether this uh, transcription factor binding sites uh, binding motive uh, presents in the marker gene of interest. The marker gene is the re marker responsive gene of interest. And also we have the DAPSIC data or just performing DAPSIC to see whether the transcription factor binds the uh, gene of interest. And uh, next, then there, there will be uh, not so many, the number will be uh, a very small. The number of this sort of transcription factors will be relatively small, and this could be available for further uh, CRISPR test. Uh, we are also developing uh, some sort of uh, strategies to see if it works such that we can rapidly uh, pinpoint the transcription factor that is responsible for regulating a gene of interest. Hmm. Yeah, so if we, you know, your focus has been on one particular gene of interest or something, you know, that, that's real, that is really focused, yet in many cases these are packages of genes. So how how would you then move to that next step of looking at? Oh, I see. How do you um, identify the, the actually? Yeah, our, yeah. we have a database previously developed. It's a plant regulomics database. I may show it later. The basic principle is that um, we collect the a gene list a set of gene that is upregulated by, uh, for example, by a, by, by a biotic stress. Uh, from this set of gene, we, want, we, we, we are wondering which uh, transcription factor may target this set of genes. And we have a sort of uh, analysis, we have an enrichment tool to help identify which transcription factor or which transcription factors target this set of genes. Uh, I may quickly go through it here. Yeah, I think that would be very interesting. Yeah. Hmm. And we also have a. Here is the here is the web server we developed. The basic principle. Can you see the uh, my desktop? Yes, yes, we can. Uh, here, the we collected a large number of uh, public data sets and uh, we processed and organized all these data sets to gene sets. And for any input for the gene list or genomic loci, we can quickly identify these are the inputs. We can quickly identify which transcription factors, epigenetic factors, uh, or other CC elements that may regulate these set of genes. 
So if you have a set of genes that responds rapidly to uh, some given a uh, given biotic stress, and we can predict which transcription factor maybe is uh, upstream target. So this uh, this this database uh, has this database uh, has included how many? Uh, you can input a gene, a single gene, or a gene list. And this database already incorporated about 64 uh, data, uh, omics data from a large number of uh, species, including uh, common wheat. Yeah, including common wheat. And we have, we are, we're also collecting uh, and organized uh, data specifically from uh, treated species uh, to construct another platform. Uh, hopefully, we can finish that platform next year. But currently, this is uh, this this platform is uh, is uh, I think it's very useful to induce to uh, predict the upregulator, and because the the data in wheat is not that abundant, we also have an orthologa analysis. Uh, from here, you can upload a set of, for example, a set of uh, wheat genes. You can upload a set of uh, wheat genes, and uh, uh, and then uh, you select the reference species. For example, the Arabidopsis. Ah, uh, I see. Yeah. And then you can see the homologous sequences. Yeah, they are homologous, homologous genes for wheat. I will try to find it later. Uh, for example, in another unknown species, and then you can uh, search for its homologous sequences in Arabidopsis and to see what their function in Arabidopsis and what the potential uh, upstream target uh, in Arabidopsis, because the regulations are, are largely uh, conserved across these species, across most species. Yeah, that's very interesting, and, and I look forward to seeing what, how this further develops <coughs> as you integrate in the additional information. So, uh, this one has been uh, published, I think, last year, or yeah, in the plant journal. But yeah, here is the uh, reference. Oh, good. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Great. So thank you very much. <clears throat> My pleasure. Yeah. So I want to again thank you for your presentation and for your work that you are doing, and for also bringing up a another platform that wasn't in your presentation that is accessible to to everyone. Uh, and perhaps when you when we uh, put the your presentation on the YouTube channel and on the IWGSC website will also include the links to this so that people will see that that's a, a valuable resource. So thank you very much uh, to everyone for joining us today and to Yijing Zhao for her uh, presentation and we look forward to seeing you and seeing everyone in our next webinar in November and hopefully at in person at the Plant and Animal Genome Conference in San Diego. So thank you very much, and we look forward to our next webinar.